Well, he didn't do it. I thought maybe Michael would pray that the Lord would send his hornet before me to ensure that everyone would be able to pay attention. Now, I've driven 600 miles with a van full of children, and so I expect you to stay with me this afternoon, and I will preach to the whites of your eyes. And if you leave, then the angels and I will finish. And then I will promptly go find a corner somewhere and rest a while. But um, we come to this, and it's a wonderful time to travel with your children. I mean that. That wasn't uh, humorous or anything like that. You find out about them. You find out more about one another than you perhaps knew when you aren't in quite such close quarters together. You find that the children reflect the character of their parents. And you begin to find this, not in every way, not in every child in the same way. That's one of the nice things. I recall that uh, when we'd had two daughters and found out we were expecting a third one, I think it was Grandpa Stoner that said, what other kind of girl could we have? Because we had such a variety in two of them already. The children show, in some sense, the character and even in a small way, the glory of their parents. It might be in something as simple as uh, their mother's eyes or their father's chin. The first one, not the second one. And they begin to see that kind of glory reflected in the children. When you see it and its good qualities, the parents are gratified. You guys know what this is like, where you, you see it, and you, yeah, they got that from my side. That kind of thing. But when you see the other habits and qualities that aren't so noble, then the parents aren't gratified, they're horrified. Because you know where that came from. Now Jesus is the son of the father. And he exhibited all the character of his father and it was all good. Jesus is the only begotten and he did not have anything that was untoward that he exhibited as the son of his father. Our, our main text is in John chapter 1. We'll be in a few other places, but primarily... Uh, this is going to focus on verse 14 with a glance at verse 18 and other things along the way from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We could pick up the reading at verse 10, speaking of the one who is the light that has come into the world. He was in the world, the world was made through him, the world did not know him. We could add there, they still don't. Verse 12 as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Do you see how you participate with him in this matter of begottenness? That's something that's maybe even a whole other message of its own in terms of our begottenness in the gospel. I'll reflect upon that a little bit along the way, but uh, Brother Seth's message about the glory in the church, and you've heard some of these others already just this first day begin to say, well, how do we see this? What is this look like and how you're going to see it is in the visible body of Christ the church these ones who in verse 13 who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God and verse 14 now and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory glory as of the only begotten from the father full of grace and truth looking down verse 18 no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. That's from the New American Standard. You'll hear some varieties on that verse in the main English translations. Now with verse 14. The Word became flesh. The Word was made flesh. He was not of the flesh. He was not a mind set on the flesh. There's a difference. He is this one that dwelt among us. Now, I haven't heard too many people give a definition of glory yet. And we're talking about glory. We're talking about different facets of it. And, and frankly, some of us will admit, at least now, part of the reason we picked the subject we did and we're glad to receive the assignment is because it doesn't talk so much about glory, but some other aspect of it. How do you talk about that which you can only receive by faith, that which you can only see by faith. Do you notice that in the illustrations we can't say it's just like this because there's not a comparison. But here's the thing that intrigues me, at least initially, about this matter of glory. It's visible. He dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. 
So it's assumed that you can know it when you see it. It's observable, it's noticeable, and yet veiled. Verse 10, he came into the world. They didn't know him. Came to the nation that had been prepared for his reception. They didn't know him. What kind of glory? We could go into 1 Corinthians 15. I don't think anybody has this ad, uh, aspect of it. Uh, we could talk about glory that is uh, anatomical or astronomical, things terrestrial, things celestial, right? Isn't that what it talks about? A star from star, they differ in glory. It uses that same word, doesn't it? This is the glory of the Word made flesh, glory that is His. His. It's not a borrowed glory from sun, moon, and stars or creation. It is a glory of the only begotten. It is the glory that is the Word made flesh. Now, now God could have used all kinds of words there instead of word, couldn't he? He could have guided those men who wrote Scripture, writing by the inspiration of the Spirit, to use all manner of other words that would have, in some sense, been true, but he didn't. He, he described this one as the Word made flesh. That, something that is written, something that's spoken, something that's communicated, something that, uh, uh, frankly, uh, it's not the only thing, but it's a major thing that separates humanity from bestiality. Word makes all the difference. Makes all the difference. He's not the feeling, the whim, or the impulse made flesh. He is not music, song, or beauty made flesh. He is not power, energy, or force made flesh. He is not love or mercy or even hatred or judgment made flesh. Sometimes I wonder about that passage that talks about uh, uh, my angel's going to go among you. Be careful how you are around him. My name dwells in him. He won't forgive you. You know the one I'm talking about? Sometimes people want to see Jesus in that. I don't know. I'm not comfortable with that. Jesus seems to go in a different direction than that. He's full of grace and truth. That's what our text says. It was a word that was made flesh, mortal, weak, corruptible, but he himself not being corrupted. Jesus did not have a sinful nature. Some of the translations will talk about a mindset on the flesh or living after the He didn't have a sinful nature. Amen. Glory is that which is illuminating and not obscuring. It is clarity and not confusion. It is a symphony and not cacophony. It's harmony and not discord or chaos. Mm -hmm. Glory. You know when you've encountered it because of its clarity. He is the only begotten, or as the NIV has it, the one and only. One Savior, one Son of God that saves, one Son that will judge. Now you know, and we won't go to the references now, but there's other sons of God in the Bible. Adam is called a son of God. The angels are referred to as sons of God. Probably something in there about the nation of Israel being his children. You can find different things like that. But Adam is not coming back for the church, is he? And neither Michael nor Gabriel will sit as the judge of all the earth, will they? Though they may be son in some sense. It is the only begotten that is full of grace and truth. It is the only begotten that has seen God and shown him, in verse 18, explained him, revealed him, opened this up. He is the only begotten. And in that very description, you have both flesh and and God. He's begotten. He's, he's begotten. He has a mother. He was conceived. He was born. He was begotten. And yet he is the only begotten. He is the word made flesh that is the only begotten. He's the son of God. And so he is both. Here, let's work at it this way. What percentage of Jesus is God? What percentage is man? Well, you know the answer to this. The standard orthodox answer is 100% on both. He is fully God and fully man. And to make him a percentage uh, has all kinds of problems. It diminishes his glory as the Son of God and thus may diminish his effectiveness as our atoning sacrifice. If you make it a percentage humanity, then how can I be going to this one who is only kind of a high priest for me, only kind of in my image as well as in God's image? See, he's both. It's mathematically impossible in the created universe. But there's the rub. With men, this is impossible, that you would have one who is both 100% divine and 100% human. 
God can have a human son and not simply by adoption. He did not look upon the earth and find favor with what, like Noah? Noah found favor with God and kind of adopt that one? No, that's not it. Some of the earliest work in the church was in terms of establishing what does Scripture say about the nature of our Savior? And so some of the early creeds, well, this will be the main focus of them. One from the 300s uses this language that, uh, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was begotten, not made. Begotten, not made made. And they aren't disputing there that the word was made flesh. They're not talking about that. Another hundred years go by, more arguing about it. Next one comes along, middle of the 400s. The Lord Jesus Christ described in this one as this selfsame one who is also actually God and actually man. He's not pretending to be one or the other. Again, not just a man that kind of is God-like, and he's not just this celestial being who comes down and is kind of looks human. Here's a phrase. I don't want to go too far with this. I do recognize the danger in seeking to affirm more than the scripture states, and that's some of the dangers of the creeds, but I'm going to give you this just simply as something to, to think about and to show that the old timers weren't, weren't uh, pumpkin heads either. They were thinking about things. Before time began, he was begotten of the Father in respect of his deity, and now now in these last days for us and, be, and behalf of our salvation, this selfsame one was born of Mary the Virgin, who is God-bearer in respect of his humanness. He's coming from both. He's the son of God before Christmas. He's the son of God from ancient days. Psalm 2 calls him the son. God isn't waiting for the incarnation to have a son. He has a son. And one of the things, too, that's hard to get your mind around is that he's always been son. There was not a time when he was not son, and then he became son. That, that may be somewhat controversial, but otherwise you have a point in time where there's a change within God. One becomes the other. Jesus was the son before the son was named Jesus. There was a time when he was not incarnate. You can look at that. You can look at that. But there was not a time when he was not. He's the word made flesh. That's what eternal means when we say that he is eternal. It means you can't go back to a beginning point for him. Uh, a little bit later, same, early 5th century. The father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. That's the father. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. It's a difference. Finally, the Holy Spirit is of the Father and the Son, not made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Now, you may not find that to be helpful, but it is something to chew about during supper time, to think about that kind of, when we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what do we mean? When we say Jesus is the Son of God, we do not mean that as a, as a diminutive title for him. That's some of the difference. Uh, sometimes, it, maybe it'll help you get your mind around it, if you don't think of uh, G-O-D as the name of the Heavenly Father, but if you, you see it as a description of the category of his existence. He's God. So when you have a son, the word made flesh, where's he coming from? Is he coming from the created order? No, he's coming from the uncreated, the eternal. He's the son of God. C.S. Lewis worked on it this way. We don't use the words begetting or begotten much in modern English, but everyone still knows what they mean. To beget is to become the father of. To create is to make. And the difference is this, when you beget, you beget something of the same kind as yourself. A man begets human babies, a beaver begets little beavers, and a bird begets eggs which turn into little birds. But when you make, you make something of a different kind from yourself. A bird makes a nest, a beaver builds a dam, a man makes a wireless set, or he may make something more like himself than that, say a statue. If he's a clear enough, Carver, he may make a statue which is very like a man indeed, but of course it is not a real man. It only looks like one. It cannot breathe or think. It's not alive. Now that is the first thing to get clear. When God begets, what God begets is God. Just, not, just as what man begets is man. What God creates is not God. Just as what man makes 
is not man. That is why men are not sons of God in the sense that Christ is. They may be like God in certain ways, but they are not things of the same kind. Men make cabinets. They, they create, they beget rather, children. There's a difference in the likeness here. We could go to some passages. I don't want to go too far down this and obscure the main point that we are looking at, the glory of the only begotten, but it is important we understand the significance of that description, only begotten, and not just read past that. The NIV in saying one and only is trying to highlight it, but in fact, because of the way our language is, it actually de-emphasizes it for me. Begotten shows the connection of origin, of where did this come from, one and only almost sounds like a meteor that landed on the planet or some kind of fossil, and it's the one and only that we have. Uh, uh, frankly, and I don't mean any disrespect uh, to the NIV or the translators there, they have made that years and years ago. In my own hearing nowadays, when I hear one and only, I feel like I'm being sold something. It's the one and only that we have. It almost is the language of P.T. Barnum in the way that we hear it. We could go to Hebrews 1 where it says in verse 5, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Talking about this ancient, uh, this, this, this origins that's before the incarnation. It's not that God has Mary give birth and then waits to see how this is going to work out. Maybe he'll do. No, this is earlier than that. If we can even speak in the sense of earlier, when you talk about something that's timeless. He is the only begotten. He's neither ape nor angel. He is man, but God is his father. And that makes all the difference. See a lot of signs as we come along the highway for antiques, uh, allegedly, uh, for some things that are supposed to be valuable because of several unique qualities that they have. Please consider this for a minute. Uh, you hear things like, only six were ever made, and that increases the value of those six items that are there. Or value for an antique is determined by its genuineness. Is the object what it presents itself to be, or is it a, is it a fake? You know, if you've ever watched Antiques Roadshow, those are always the ominous words where, now you see the scoring on the side here? That really shouldn't be there. And that's when the person's face begins to quiver and break a little bit because they paid 10 grand for it and they're finding out it's worth about 120. As an example of a fine forgery, you know, this kind of thing. Genuineness determines value. Inherent value, is it something valuable, a precious metal, a rare wood, particular jewels? Is it of a rare quality, the craftsmanship on it, just they don't make it like this anymore? Think of all those things. We've all seen examples of a Navajo blanket or a clay pot or a... Uh, a cavalry sword that has value because of those things. It's genuine, it has an inherent value, or itself is of a rare quality. Now, what is it about Jesus? He's genuine. He's, he's really the Son of God. What about his inherent value? Well, that's, to use another commercial, that's priceless. How are you going to describe that and put a limit on it? Is he rare? Yeah, he's, he's the only begotten. He's the one and only. We do this with stuff and elevate the value, this is the only bag of potato chips from the World Series, you know, and of 1895. What? It's still just a bag of chips. Well, it's like when people say, this is worth thus and so. I always think to myself, if you get somebody to pay you that much for it, you better take it, because it's really not worth that much. Jesus is the real one. He's the valuable one. He's the one and only. He's of the highest quality. He still works. He's still in working order. There's a glory because of his rarity. And you can't even use the word rarity, right? Because it almost sounds like there's another one waiting, and there's not. He's not plan B or C. He's the only plan, and there never was another one. And part of the glory, and this is what we've touched on in just a few of the other messages, part of the glory is because his glory is transmitted, that he will manifest his glory in the church. What? Through all these clay pots I see before me? Yeah. Break them open. There's treasure inside. It's transmissible. There's one. He's in perfect condition. He's precious. He's fairer than the lilies, sweeter than honey. But you notice what those are? Comparisons. He's more than beautiful, and he's more than satisfying as a, as a, as a food. 
glory is almost mysterious. It almost defies definition. Do you ever find that when you're trying to define this, and, and Brother Michael will have to work with this tomorrow in terms of Jesus being the brightness of God's glory, is the best we can do is just say that he's shiny? Don't you just feel small by that? You say, but there's got to be more than that. If glory is just a measure of his wattage, is he halogen or is he incandescent? You know, you just say, this is not an adequate view. If you have to do the lumen count to say, oh, well, let's see. Now, Moses' face compared to the burning bush, what was the, what was the wattage difference? Is that the determination of glory? When Jesus breaks open on the Mount of Transfiguration and they see a little bit of him, it's not just his face that's glowing. There's something else going on there. You got different light bulbs that you buy that say, this shows you what the real colors are. Have you ever seen these ads where, where the woman just looks washed out and bedraggled? And they say, oh, it's the light bulbs. And they change the light bulbs and suddenly she's 10 years younger or something like that. Well, in, in Christ, in his glory, he shows people in their real colors. He really does. There's no masking effects in his glory. His glory shows the real thing. There's a picture in one of the Chronicles of Narnia that I thought of in one of the early messages. I wanted to bring it here just briefly. Voyage of the Dawn Treader. They're going out to the edge of that known world, and the sun is really bright as they're traveling on the ocean. They don't know how they're going to stand the brightness of it, and they begin to drink the waters, and they find that the water is not salty like they expected, but sweet. In fact, they say it's almost like drinking light, and when they've drank from it, then they can see and the brightness isn't so great, and they can stare right at the sun because they've partaken of this, of this liquid. And I think about that as we talk about glory. Some of the things that we describe will be for people who are at a distance, this is too bright. They can't look at it. But there's other things that have the, as they've partaken of it, they can see it. They can see it. The glory of Christ that will be such a delight to his friends, that same brightness will be a terror to his enemies. Now, in these comparisons, I'm, all we can do in this is point. So it's kind of like this. I, I can't reach in and say, this is glory. Here, I've got a package of it. Here, why does everybody take a little bit of it? Just sample it. It's not in a material form in that way. Uh, we can look at images. Uh, uh, much of the news of the last several years have, has been uh, associated with the conflict overseas. And, and in our town, as I'm sure many of your towns, you've had the ones who don't come back except in the box. And the town stops for a day, and there's some kind of notice for this. You know what's a comfort to me? I'll just tell you, as a man, it comforts me that people in their late teens and 20s actually care enough to give their life for something. For the 20 years preceding that, it didn't seem like anybody was willing to die for anything. Just something to think about in comparison. You read about these men. These men... These men inspire me. I, I have a hard time getting up, get going in the morning. I think about the guy that has his leg blown off and is determined to go through the training so that he can go back and lead his squadron overseas. So he can go back. Part of going back means he has to be able to run an eight-minute mile with the prosthetic leg, by the way. And there's guys that do this. And there's a glory to that. That's why they're called military heroes. That's why there's a parade and those sorts of things that are given and medals handled, handed out. You have men who fall on the grenade and save their men and lose their own life. And there's glory and honor that comes to them. But his death did not save the men from hell. It only saved them from death. See, there's a limit. It's a little bitty picture of glory. Or you could look at it a totally different way. A medical researcher like Salk and Sabine from the old days and polio. Glory to their name? Absolutely. Things we've been spared? Absolutely. Kids go through this and they get shot all the time as little kids anymore. It's covering all kinds of things for them. And we're glad for it as parents. But you know what those shots do? It saves them from disease. And only that one or that group. Not all disease. Doesn't save them from car accidents. Doesn't save them from anything else. We're all still mortal. The glory of the only begotten is greater than any military hero. The death of the captain of our salvation saved us from death and from hell. His glory is greater than any doctor. The death of the great physician saves us from sin and from guilt. Part of what made Jesus glorious is his singularity. There really is not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. He's the only begotten. 
And this phrase uh, is only used a few times in Scripture. I want to give you just a few of them. There's pictures of it in the Old Testament, but in terms of the, the use of the word particularly, I'll refer only to the New, of course. Uh, three references in Luke's Gospel. I'm going to give you these references. We'll go through them very quickly. Luke 7, 12. Luke 8, 41 and 42, and Luke 9, 38 is where you have this use of the word only begotten, none of them referring to Jesus. When you get to John's gospel, you have only begotten, and it's, it's talking about Jesus. But Luke's gospel, Luke 7, 12, is about the dead man who was, quote, the only son of his mother. And you get that phrase. Luke 8, 41 and 42, talking about Jairus, who had an only daughter, right? Luke 9, 38, my son, mine only child, is how it's described, Luke 9, 38. Now, do you ever think that maybe the reason Christ was put in the path of these people was because of God's tenderness, that Jesus himself, apart from the other brothers that he has through Mary, sisters through Mary and Joseph, he is in one sense an only child. Isn't that a strange accumulation of that, that, that those three different accounts are only children? Do you think that there's a special tenderness from God the Father because he has only one son? His tenderness towards widows and orphans extends here as well. Amen. We have other references in John's gospel we won't get into. Perhaps others will. John 3.16, John 3.18, referring to this only begotten. Uh, 1 John 4.9, and that's pretty much all of them. There's one other, Hebrews 11.17, and this is not referring to Jesus. This is referring to Isaac. This is the picture in the Old Covenant of what it means to have an only begotten. Abraham had other sons. God had other sons in the sense of Adam and humans and angels, right? We talked about that. But only one that was the son of promise. Only one whose birth was miraculous. Abraham had Ishmael. Ishmael wasn't the son of promise. Abraham married after Sarah died. He had all kinds of other sons through that other wife. But he only had one, the, the son whom thou lovest thine only son. There was one Isaac. Isaac, the son of promise, no one else. Isaac, supernatural birth, God's intervention, no one else. Isaac, the hope for the family, the promises carried by him and by no other. Sarah had no other children. His uniqueness, the uniqueness of Isaac, increased his preciousness to his father. In the case of Christ the only begotten, his uniqueness enhances his preciousness to the Father. The Son whom you love. That record in Genesis 22 isn't for the sake of Abraham, it's for the sake of us. Why is that language used there? Take now thy son, thine only son, the son whom thou lovest. Why does it say it that way? It's because the Father is writing this centuries before he himself is going to have to walk in Abraham's place. Before he himself will have to consent to the offering of his son. And as glorious as that account is, would Isaac's death have done anything eternal if he had actually died? No. Well, who would it have saved? Think about it further. The death of the ram only saved who? Isaac. Didn't save anybody else. Isaac had to die later. Where's the ram then, right? There comes a point where you follow through on this. That wasn't the point. The death of the only begotten in Christ, he accomplished far more by his death. And therefore, his glory is far greater. I think about two verses together, two passages. Genesis 22, the son whom you love, offer him. And then also, uh, strangely, we could see the pattern there, uh, Psalm 22. Why hast thou forsaken me? Think of those two together. That's the glory of the only begotten. That what he's doing is not simply being, as in begotten, but he is the only begotten who dies. That's the point of glory. And that is why of John 1.18, he is the one who can reveal God, make him known, declare him. Uh, John 1.18, that last phrase there. The variety in the verses is a textual issue. I'm not expert to go into. It gets boring very fast. It's all true and correct in any of the renderings because you can go elsewhere in Scripture and have them affirm the same thing. Whether you call Jesus the only begotten Son or in fact the only begotten God or God the one and only, those are all, those are all true. 
Uh, in terms of making God known there, uh, other verses, I won't give them to you now, but other places in Scripture talks about uh, they began to relate their experiences, or he told them everything that had happened, and that's the way that that word is used there in terms of he has made God known, he has shown him. This is the glory that Christ has made God known. He's told his disciples about him. And beyond speech, he has lived a life that testifies of the nature of God the Father. Amen. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ, John 1.17. Grace and truth came through him. In Jesus Christ, in him, is the happy marriage of grace and truth. The woman taken in adultery, John chapter 8, how does Jesus respond to her? Grace and truth. Grace says, neither do I condemn you. Truth says, go and sin no more. There's both. He, in, using the picture from Solomon, he divides the baby. He settles the issue. Over and over you'll see this. Where we as people, we're, gonna, we're all, we're all one-legged. We all fall one way or the other on this. We're either too merciful or too hard. And he is the one who is full of grace and and truth. In the judgment of Jesus, the only begotten, no stones were thrown, but neither was sin, you can fill in the blank here, neither was sin tolerated, neither was it welcome, neither was it made comfortable, neither was it overlooked. Uh, some of the remarks earlier con concerning the nature of the body of Christ and whom uh, God receives, just use the word cancer and think about it that way. Do you tolerate cancer in your body? Do you welcome cancer in your body? Do you affirm cancer in your body? No, you call for the man with the knife because it will kill you. It will be fatal to the body. That's why you don't settle down and tolerate such things. No man has seen God, the book of Hebrews says, but we see Jesus. See, there's something in this begottenness where the one whom we cannot get our arms around, he sends a son that we could sit at dinner with. Isn't that part of just the weird nature of the Gospels? Do you have any other experience to compare to that? Any other illustration of that? Yeah, it was just like the time. No, there is no just like the time. The Gospels are the only record you have where you say, this is God in the flesh. Not just God. We have encounters with him from the Old Testament, ways in which he's revealed himself. God in a bush, God in this, God in, right? But God in the flesh, that's different. One who gets sleepy one who gets tired from walking, one who gets hungry, one who can be tempted in all points like as we are. God is light, no sin in him. He can't be tempted, but the Son of God, that's different. That's different, and that's part of his glory. That's what accompanies Jesus, his glory and honor, and not just because of his birth, his incarnation, his miracles, or his teaching, but he has glory because of the suffering of death, Hebrews 2.9. We want to know in our measure, in our day when we can, what it means to behold his glory. We want to have in some measure to be able to say we know what that's like, even though we weren't there in the Gospels. Not just a vicarious trying, and you were there, John chapter 6, bread from heaven, but to actually know in our own day, what does it mean we see Jesus? Remember Hebrews 2.9 says that well after he died and ascended. Amen. They aren't talking about gospel accounts. Jesus did this. He went here. He wore this. He did that. Something else going on. I want to be more like those Greeks. John 12 and 20. Sir, we would see Jesus. This is our desire. It's a good desire. It would be a great shame if the church of today was outdone by the pagans of the first century. Is Jesus? Because you know, when you want to see Jesus, he's inconvenient. You could invite him over for supper, and, and it may be a trap you've set for him, and he turns it on you. There's all kinds of things when you read the Gospels. Got to be careful when you say, we would see Jesus. Remember that there will be a repentance, a confrontation that comes. He is not a tidy person. He's not always congenial. What if the face of Jesus that we see is in fact a frown or maybe tears? We want to be careful and not be presumptuous and too rapidly assuring ourselves of his favor 
because we are yet still in the body. Let us be quick to repent and to correct easy. One other sobering thing that I think about in connection with just the nature of church today, and I'm doing this because we have, in our measure, been begotten, and there is a bridge there in this. There are seven churches that are spoken to in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. Is it all going well with them? Do they all have wonderful reports to send to one another and to tell them how things are going? No. In, in our day of triumphalism, where you have churches that are as apparently successful as any U.S. corporation, we must guard our hearts against two extremes. One, that bigger is always better. That's an extreme. It's wrong. Remember Ephesus? Doctrinally sound, emotionally dull. They left their first love. The second extreme, oddly enough, Smaller is always better. And you know why I know these things? Because I hold both extremes at the same time. I am a puzzle of contradiction. The faithfulness of any church is not determined mathematically in either direction, whether they have one dozen or a thousand dozen. I mean, if you're, if you're thinking that smaller is always better, remember the man with the napkin. He wrapped up the one pound, that's, and he was in trouble for it. So we've got to be careful with this. I find that I can beat myself up that our church isn't giant, and then I try to console myself that small size must mean that we're faithful. And I can't do either. I'm wrong on both sides. Those are extremes. Jesus, that God the Father, said that God the Father is seeking worshipers. John 4, 23. Jesus commands in Matthew 28 that we are to make disciples. Those are the same thing. Different words, same people worshipers and disciples. Just very briefly, as you an analyze what goes on around you in church life or in your own congregation, don't break those two apart. Worshipers and disciples are the same. You have these dichotomies that people try to break into where they delight to know God's grace and others delight to know God's truth and to play them against each other, and they're both. They're both necessary parts of the body. They're both necessary parts of our own walk to be a worshiping disciple. The reason we have trouble with it is because he's the one full of grace and truth. And we in our following after him try to have that same balance so that we will ne be neither mindless fanatics nor heartless scribes, but that we would yield both heart and head to God. We want to desire that God by his spirit will make us into true worshipers. Some last thoughts as we begin to move toward the close. We want to see the glory of the only begotten. We want to behold his glory. But some of the ways in which we behold his glory are unpleasant. Look at the nature of scripture and all the warnings that are there about joining with him in his sufferings. And the things that he's left behind for you. Does it, won't you know him better in that? Haven't you found that in your own biographies that you say, boy, this pit, this trough right here, that's when I found him. That's some of the testimony we've heard already from, from the others who preached. Found God in the bottom of a pit. Does that mean you want to get rid of the pit? Well, you would rather not do it again, but what I gained from it. See, when you say we want to see Jesus, it's not always Hosanna, Hosanna, get our coats and our palm branches. Sometimes it's, let's go down to this garden after we sing a hymn. Yeah. Only sometimes the roles are reversed, and he's the one who's there with you as you're betrayed and crucified. But you get to know him, and that counts for something. It is not likely that many of us will see Jesus in, as we sing, victory unto victory. I don't mind those songs. I don't mean to sound like I'm, I'm kind of crank. However, a lot of that is perceived by faith and not by the eye. It's not ocularly perceived, right? Amen. Victory unto victory, marching, Ground trembling beneath our tread. We've talked about that recently at the home church. Mm, I don't think we can always say that. I think of the words of Jesus. If they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Yeah. And it, I, I can't speak for our congregation, but at least for our, our city and our location, it's dry. It's dry. And so I don't want to have expectations of things that are, that are greater than what is promised. I want to be careful with this. He may call us through glory and rejoicing and he may call us through tears he is unique and yet he's also familiar this amplifies his glory he is the one and only but he's also the only begotten well i'm begotten you're begotten every human being is begotten 
Jesus came through that same process. That's part of what makes him Jesus and not simply the word made flesh. And you can keep that kind of too, distance in, too distant in your mind. He's familiar. His participation in our humanity is a point of wonder. We can imagine a heavenly being. We all can imagine that, the whole angel showing up, talking to you. We can imagine that. We can even imagine a man from heaven. But a man from heaven who, who's really one of us, not just looks like us, not just took a body of one of us, inhabited it for a while, and left the body and moves. Ah, that's harder to imagine one who is both the one who descended and the one who ascended. Same one. Not just wearing a body, not just visiting a body, and not just pretending to be human. When Jesus was weary, when he was hungry, when he was tempted, he was not pretending. He is the one who is, in one sense, a heavenly being that becomes an earthly being. He's the one who's from above and now comes down so that we can be born from above. It's marvelous. One who is eternal, who suffers pain. One who knows how this is going to end, suffers anguish, disappointment, frustration. Wouldn't you describe that emotion when he's over Jerusalem saying, how oft would I have gathered you unto me? What else would you call? I call that frustration. I'd call that disappointment. You know, those things aren't sin. They can be, but they don't have to be. But this one who is in, in the body is still in his extended body, Christ with us. And we see it in the church. Not simply similar to us, but he is one of us. There is right now a man in heaven. A man. There's DNA in heaven. A man. Not just looking like a man, just appearing like a man. A man. That's some of the mind-bending glory of Gabriel's announcement to Mary. Not that Mary wasn't worthy. Of course she was worthy. That's the whole point of the passage. There's only one of her, too. But the mind-bending nature is that the Son of God is coming through you. And you know, Gabriel could say that to each one of us, couldn't he, huh? In some sense. Not in the sense of begotten and bearing and raising the Son of God, but isn't that what the gospel is in terms of the mission of the church today? That it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That how Christ comes to others is through you, Mary. He's begotten in us. He is the only begotten. If Jesus failed, there's no backup plan. And if you aren't saved by Jesus, then you won't be saved at all. He's it. God had one son. One. Not another one. Not another kind. One. He's the only Savior. The only begotten. And the only one full of grace and truth. And it is his glory that the apostles beheld. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He's it. Our final record will be coming from Psalm Two. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. There is a great danger we read about in verse 12 of Psalm 2. The danger is that he would be angry. The danger is that we would perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. We are told, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And this is where we must land. And how do we respond to the glory of the only begotten, the glory who is full of grace and truth? We kiss the Son. Amen. 